Thursday, April 17, 2098, 4.35 p.m., USC General Justice Building, Joint Base Grissom. I had just finished my coffee and looked at my watch. It had been a very long day and I was anxious to get it over with. I had spent three hours giving testimony and answering questions before they put me in this tiny room with nothing but a television and my own thoughts to keep me company. I was asked to wait here until further notice, but that was over two hours ago. Surely, I thought, the board should have come to some conclusion by now. Suddenly, the door opened, and my legal representative, Commander Tom Baker, entered the room. The council just adjourned for the day, Lieutenant Jones, he said. That's me, by the way. William Jones, Bill to my friends and family. I'm a senior flight lieutenant in the United States Space Corps, which used to be called the Space Force and was formed almost 80 years ago. They want you back at 0800 tomorrow, so you'd better get back to your quarters. Commander Baker said. And remember, don't socialize with any of the other witnesses in this case. Especially your wife. You mean the cheating whore known as my soon-to-be ex-wife, don't you, sir? I asked. He nodded his head. Yes. She is, he said. Come on, Lieutenant, get out of here. And stay out of trouble. Aye, sir, I said, standing up. I stretched out my legs, grabbed my case, and headed out the door. I got into my tiny electric car and then headed back to the BOQ. That's bachelor officer's quarters, for those unfamiliar with the term. When I got to my room, I took off my uniform, grabbed a frozen faux meat hamburger, and threw it in the microwave. While it was cooking, I got a beer out of the refrigerator and uncorked the lid. When my hamburger was ready, I pulled it out and ate it in three big bites, trying not to notice the flavor. They were good for camping or a quick snack, but they were a poor substitute for the real thing which was getting harder and harder to get. I sat down in my chair and turned on the TV to catch up on the latest news. There was nothing to catch my attention, so I leaned back in my chair and thought back over the past few weeks. Until recently, I was the weapons officer on the USS Armstrong, the Corps' newest, largest, fastest, and most advanced spacecraft. Named for the astronaut who first set foot on the moon in 1969, the Armstrong was considered the most advanced machine built by human hands. It seated 110 officers and crew members and was powered by two plasma ion propulsion systems. It was claimed that Armstrong could reach Jupiter in less than 50 days. In addition, the Armstrong had enough firepower to destroy anything that threatened it. In addition to nuclear-tipped cruise missiles, it carried three pulse energy guns, a railgun, and several short-range mini-lasers that worked very much like the old miniguns of the early 21st century. In short, it was a cool ship and my hand was controlling all that firepower. Why all this firepower, you may ask? About 45 years ago, one of our shuttles was attacked by an Iranian spacecraft. Unfortunately, the shuttle was unarmed and had no defenses. A missile fired by the Iranians hit the shuttle from below, destroying it. Outer space is the most inhospitable environment known to man, so everyone died instantly. We almost started a war because of this incident, but the diplomats somehow managed to avoid it. However, the Space Corps has decided that from now on, every manned spaceship in its fleet will be armored and equipped for combat. Receiving orders to serve on the Armstrong on its maiden voyage to Jupiter was made all the more gratifying by the fact that my wife of five years, Tabitha or Tabby as she liked to call herself, had also been ordered to the same ship. Unlike me, however, she would be serving as the ship's chief pilot. At first I was beyond excited that we would be serving together on the newest ship in the fleet. It was the first time the two of us were assigned to the same ship at the same time. We were high school sweethearts who vowed to be exclusive to each other shortly after we turned 18. We both wanted to fly into space and applied to the academy our senior year of high school. We were both accepted and got engaged right out of high school, planning to get married after graduating from the academy. She got her wish and became a pilot. I did not become a pilot and was assigned to operations and weapons. I was discouraged by this at first, but the more I got to shoot and blow things up, the more I enjoyed it. After graduating from the academy, we were married, each in our dress uniforms. We were assigned to the same base, but unfortunately our missions often kept us apart. It's hard when one spouse is constantly off in space for two months or so, but it's even worse when both are doing the same thing. Sometimes she would go on a mission for two months, leaving me waiting at home. Other times I would go on a mission. There were times when we both left at the same time, but on different missions. Needless to say, we didn't spend much time together, so we made the most of the time we had. Don't get me wrong, 
I wasn't just sitting at home twiddling my thumbs while she was away. I became interested in a fairly new type of martial arts called GravTac, which was designed specifically for low to medium pressure environments. I had practiced martial arts in high school and was immediately attracted to it. It required strength, tactical thinking, and knowledge of how objects react in a low gravity environment. In all this time, I never even considered the possibility that Tabby might cheat on me. I always believed that she would do the right thing, so I never worried about it. Although I was tempted at times, I decided that I would never cheat on the woman I loved. So the thought that she might be seeing someone behind my back never even crossed my mind. I remembered how we used to fantasize about making love in zero gravity, on the moon or Mars. We always said that if the opportunity presented itself, we would definitely try it, at least once. So naturally, when we both got our orders to serve on the Armstrong, it was like a dream come true for both of us. Unfortunately, that dream turned into a nightmare from which there was no way out. My thoughts went back to the day I left. Friday, January 3rd, 2098 Canaveral Launch Complex, Florida. Donning my spacesuit and launch kit, I said nothing as the technicians put me in the seat of the passenger shuttle that would take me and 20 others to the orbital dock where the Armstrong was located. As chief pilot, Tabby went up in the first shuttle, which had launched a little over three hours ago. I was in the third shuttle to lift off that day. Three more would follow. Sitting next to me was the Armstrong's first officer, Commander Jason Travers, or Bull, as he was called because of his size and general demeanor. I knew Bull from back at the academy. He'd been an instructor there when Tabby and I were in school, and back then he was a hard ass who didn't put up with anyone's shit. He expected students to give 110% and wouldn't settle for less. He was also Tubby's counselor at the time. I attended a few of his classes, but other than that, I had little contact with him. So, Jones, can't wait to finally serve with your wife? asked Bull. Yes, sir, it is, I said. Well, this will go down in history, he said. I hear we're going farther than anyone has ever gone before, I told him. Jupiter and back in less than 100 days, he said. It's going to be a very interesting mission. I could feel and hear the pumps working beneath us in the rocket that would eventually lift us into the sky, and I knew we would be leaving Earth very soon. Bull knew it too, as did everyone else in the shuttle. We were all veterans of spaceflight, so this was nothing new to us. Bull looked around to make sure everyone was ready to go. So everyone say goodbye to Earth. That's it, so get over it, he growled before resting his head back on the seat cushion. We closed our visors and prepared to launch. We felt the car shake as the engine started, and then felt the immense force of gravity as the rocket began to lift off. Looking out the window, I could see the clouds rushing by as we rose into the sky. Soon, the blue sky blackened and I could make out the curvature of the planet below. I never tired of looking at it. The shuttle shuddered as the boosters disengaged. I knew they would fall back to Earth and land near where we took off from so they could be used again. After about an hour, I saw a structure in the distance. There she is. Bull said, opening the visor. We'll be docking soon. Half an hour later, the shuttle approached the large open dock and matched its speed to that of the dock. Two large tubular structures emerged from it and made contact with the shuttle. A hiss of air was heard as the pressure in the dock stabilized. That's it, Bull said. Get ready to experience some gravity. Right now, the ship should be at a pressure of 0.8 G. I knew from the orientation documents that the Armstrong was equipped with a gravity system that could be adjusted as needed. This would help alleviate the effects of prolonged weightlessness, which included fluid shifts, muscle atrophy, and bone loss. We waited for the crew to signal, and soon a green light flashed over the hatches. Bull unbuckled his harness and stood up, ordering the others to follow suit. After he stepped into the aisle, I unbuckled my harness and stood up, grabbing my bag. It was strange going from the near-zero gravity of the shuttle to the somewhat reduced but present gravity of the ship. Within a few steps, I felt the weight of my backpack and bag. Station launch in four hours, people, Bull called out as we entered the ship. Let's get going. There are three more shuttles right behind us. I already knew where our cabin was from the orientation materials, so the first thing I did was head there, hoping to see Tabby. Unfortunately, she wasn't there but I could tell she was already in the cabin because her things took up half the space in our tiny closet. I put away my gear, took off my heavy spacesuit, and put on my normal flight suit. 
Grabbing my black uniform cap, I went to the bridge to take my place at the weapons console. I had a lot of work to do before we could launch. When I got there, the bridge was bustling with activity. Tabby was working on the pre-flight checklist, so I left her alone. I fired up the console and ran the calibration routines, then took a printout of the weapons inventory list. I then walked over to the two cruise missile platforms, physically checked the serial numbers on the list, and made sure the locks were in place. I then walked over to each of the weapon stations and verified that they were locked and ready for immediate use. I then returned to the bridge to report to the captain on my supplies. I had to wait for the medic to finish his report before I could submit my inventory, but I was fine with that. When the doc left, the captain looked at me. I recognized him immediately, Captain Alan Simmons. Lieutenant Jones, he said, taking my inventory sheet. As I recall, we served on the Shepherd. Yes, sir, we did, I said. He signed the inventory and we checked our key numbers. Only three people had keys to the cruise missiles, me, the captain, and the first officer. Two of those three keys were required to launch the missiles. Good to have you with us, Jones, he said. I understand you and our chief pilot are married. Tabby turned and smiled upon hearing this. Yes, sir, it is, I told him. Good, Alan said. It will help make the trip more exciting for you. Yes, sir, I hope so, I said, looking at Tabby. She gave me a mischievous smile and then went back to her business. By then, Bull had reached the bridge and was strutting around, checking to make sure everything was in place. Bull threw me a look that could freeze a solar flare, and I took it as a hint that it was time to return to my post. I'd better get back to my station, sir. Alan nodded his head and turned to the next person demanding his attention. I returned to my station and verified that all calibration tasks had been completed. From my point of view, everything was locked down and in perfect order. I knew from my time on the Shepherd that Captain Simmons liked to do impromptu weapons drills and target practice from time to time, so it was important that I was ready to lock and load weapons at a moment's notice. It was also critical that the targeting system always remained calibrated. As a rule, once calibrated, the system remained so unless there was a serious malfunction or someone interfered with its operation. Nevertheless, each shift began with a calibration check. Finally, Alan began a pre-launch check of each station while we all strapped into our seats. Operative, he called out. All systems are ready for launch, replied Lieutenant Sam Doctor. Alice Brewster, operations officer and my immediate supervisor. Engineering, Alan called out. All systems are normal and within normal parameters. Proceed to launch, sir, said Chief Engineer Lieutenant Sam Doctor. Brian Faulkner. Guns. All systems calibrated and locked down, sir. All weapons accounted for, I said. Calm. Communications 5x5, five five, sir, said Senior Communications Officer Lieutenant Siambader. Denise Simpson. Navigation. Course plotted and locked, sir. Estimated time of arrival at Mars Station is 440 hours, reported the Chief Navigation Officer, Lieutenant Ryan Halcom whose console was next to Tabby's at the front of the bridge. Number one. All personnel in place and accounted for, sir. All stations report ready for launch, Bull reported from his station just behind and to Alan's left. Alan nodded his head and pressed a button on the console in front of him. Houston, this is Armstrong. Request permission to launch. Launch authorization granted, Armstrong. Godspeed, came a voice from the communication speaker overhead. Alan nodded his head and pressed the button on the console again. Roger that, Houston, he said. He pressed another button and spoke again. Spadock, this is Armstrong. Launch authorization has been received. Shut down and retract all lines. Copy that, Armstrong. The lines are retracting. We heard a few sharp sounds and realized it was the lines retracting. From that point on, we were on our own energy. A few moments later, we heard confirmation that all lines were fully retracted and the ship could move forward. Start the engines, Alan ordered. Engines are running, Brian said. Take us out, helmsman. Nice and easy. Don't scratch the paint, Alan said with a smile. Aye, sir, Tabby said, pulling two levers and holding the control column. The ship slowly began to move forward, and I could see the exit from the spaceport getting closer. I knew that at this point we were only operating on maneuvering thrusters. 
Firing the ion fusion plasma thrusters inside the space dock would do serious damage to both the dock and the Armstrong. Soon we were away from the big structure. The space dock is ready, Tabby said. From here we'll spiral out of Earth orbit to a point between the Earth and the Moon, where we'll fire two big engines. Q-Spot, it was called, and I could see the tracking on the navigator's console from where I sat. An hour later, the navigator spoke. ETA to Q-Point is two microns, sir, Ryan said. The road is clear. That meant the forward sensors had detected no debris or organic material, such as rocks, in our path that could damage the ship. Copy that, Alan said. Engineering. Engines warmed up and ready, sir, Brian said. Alan pressed a button on his console. Houston, Armstrong. Approaching point Q. Approaching Q point. Copy that, Armstrong. We all watched the countdown timers on our consoles and got ready. When the timer reached zero o'clock, Alan spoke again. Pump up the tires and light a fire, helmsman. Let's see what this girl can do. Tabby's hands fluttered over the console as she answered. Kicking tires, starting fires. Aye, sir, she said. She slid the control levers all the way forward, and we all felt the initial force as the ion fusion plasma engines opened. We heard a faint hum as the engines increased speed, and we felt the G-force increase. I realized that at that moment we were flying through space faster than a human had ever flown. I looked at Tabby, feeling a sense of pride in the way she handled herself, and this huge vessel. She looked back at me and I smiled, winked, and gave her a thumbs up. She smiled back. Glancing at Bull, I thought he was about to explode, so I turned back to my console. About an hour later, I got my first clue that all was not going to be well on this voyage when Bull posted the officer's schedule on the bridge. I wasn't surprised that he posted the schedule. Usually the first mate did that. But I was surprised to see that I had been put on the second shift. You must realize that there is no such thing as night or day in space. Our chronometers, as on all other ships in the Corps, are synchronized with the chronometers in Houston. When night falls in Houston, the lights on the ship are dimmed significantly to give the crew a sense that night has fallen. This usually happens during the second shift. Corps bridge officers typically work 12-hour shifts. Thus, there are two shifts, first shift and second shift. The Corps has a long tradition of putting the senior bridge officers on the first shift and the less experienced and lower-ranking officers on the second shift. This is not written down in any way, and the first officer has quite a bit of leeway in this matter. But it still hurt to see Bull put me on the second shift. It was almost like a demotion. Worse, it meant that Tabby and I would have almost no time together since she'd be working the first shift. If I was lucky, we'd be able to see each other for a few minutes during my shift. To say I was pissed off was an understatement. And Bull knew it. Is there a scheduling problem, Lieutenant? I heard Bull ask. I looked up and saw him in front of my console. By this time, Alice had walked over to me. Apparently, she had seen the schedule too, and was as interested as I was in hearing his explanation. Am I still the senior weapons officer, sir? I asked. Of course, yes, Bull said. Then why am I working second shift? Because, in my opinion, this is the best place for you, he said, his voice beginning to draw attention. Look, Lieutenant, if you have a scheduling problem, work it out with the captain. Through me. By this time, Alan had approached my console. Is there a problem, gentlemen? He asked. Lieutenant. Jones doesn't seem to like the bridge schedule, sir, Bull said. Alan looked at the schedule and frowned as he read it. I understand how he might feel, number one, Alan said. It's very unusual, don't you agree? Yes, sir. Under normal circumstances, I would, Bull said. I simply believe that Lieutenant Jones's knowledge and experience is best utilized on the second shift. And I believe it will give us an opportunity to train some of the other gunnery officers, to give them experience on the bridge on the first shift. My bullshit detectors went off just at that moment. I couldn't believe the crap he was spewing at the captain. Is that the only reason, Commander, or is there something else? asked Alan. Apparently, he didn't believe it either. If I may, sir, I will speak freely, Bull said quietly. Always, number one, Alan said. 
I've never been a big fan of spouses working on the same ship, especially in such close quarters. I don't want either of them distracted from their duties. That's what I thought, Alan said. I understand how you feel, but I'm not going to let this tour affect their morale. Make sure they spend time with each other, do you hear me? Yes, sir, Bull said. Alan looked at me before he spoke. Can you do that, Lieutenant? He asked. Yes, sir, I said. He nodded his head. Good. Carry on, all of you, he said before walking away. Bull stared after me for a moment, and then a smirk appeared on his face. Don't worry, Jones. I'll keep an eye on your wife, he said before walking away. I looked at Alice and was about to say something, but she put her finger to her lips. Don't say anything, Bill, she said. We'll talk later. Go ahead, I'll call Lieutenant Robinson. Yes, ma'am, I said quietly. I glanced over at Tabby and noticed that she was trying to focus on some place on her console. I could see that her face was flushed, but I wasn't sure if it was from embarrassment or guilt. I turned and walked off the bridge, feeling more embarrassed and humiliated than I ever had on the ship. Something about it stank to high heaven. I headed to the galley, hoping to get something to eat. It wasn't the usual mealtime, and I knew they wouldn't have anything special, but I needed something in my stomach. Not much in stock right now, Lieutenant, said the man behind the plexiglass partition. All we have are hamburgers made of artificial meat. They taste like crap, but they're guaranteed to fill you up. Sorry. That's enough for now, I said. I'll take one. He took one and put it on my tray. He held out a small package of flavored ketchup. Would you like some axle grease to make it more palatable? He asked with a smile. Sure, why not, I said, taking the package. Thanks. Anytime, Lieutenant, he said. I grabbed a small bottle of chocolate milk and headed to a vacant table. I ate the burger, slathered the flatbread with ketchup, and gulped down the milk. The commander was right. It tasted like shit, but I was full. And the ketchup made it taste a little better. I put the tray away, threw the trash in the container, and headed for my quarters. I lay down on my shelf and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I wondered what Bull was really up to. What did he mean about looking after Tubby? I tossed and turned for about an hour, but I couldn't settle down. Frustrated, I finally got up and put on my workout clothes, a t-shirt and shorts. I put on my shoes and socks and headed for the small gym on one of the lower decks. When I got there, I was relieved to see that I was alone. Good, I thought. It would give me a chance to vent my frustration without talking to anyone, which I didn't think I could do without getting angry. I did some stretching, then did a little workout on the treadmill and the weight machine. Then I went to the gravity regulator on the wall and reduced the gravity in the room to 0.4 G. I immediately felt the difference. I immediately felt the difference. I then spent the next half hour practicing some of the grab tack techniques I had learned before leaving Earth. By then, I had worked up a good sweat and felt like I could finally fall asleep. I put the gravity back where it should be and went back to my quarters. I took a shower in the tiny head, set my alarm clock, and lay back down. I fell asleep in the blink of an eye. When the alarm rang, I got up, showered, shaved, put on my uniform, and headed to the galley for a snack. It was a hell of a lot better than the faux meat burger I'd had before. I got to the bridge just as Tabby was leaving. Hello, stranger, I said when I saw her. She looked at me and smiled. Hi, she said. Look, I didn't get a chance to tell you but I thought you did a hell of a job with the launch, I said. Thank you, she said to me. Look, maybe I'll come over on my lunch break and we can spend some time together, I said. I could see the wheels turning in her head and thought she was going to make me an excuse as to why it wouldn't work. Thankfully, it didn't. Sure, I'll set the alarm, she said. Maybe you can eat me instead of one of those fake burgers. Works for me, I said. I'll see you in six hours. I'll be there, she said and gave me a quick kiss. I love you. I love you too, I told her. I watched her walk away and thought that maybe we could make it work. I turned around and saw Bull's grinning face. About damn time you showed up, Jones, he said. I looked at my watch. My shift doesn't officially start for another 15 minutes, Commander, I said. I just wanted to talk to my wife before going on duty. If that's okay with you, sir. 
For a moment, I thought he was going to lash out at me, but he calmed down. Yeah, all right, he said, and went further down the corridor. I went onto the bridge and took over for Lieutenant Robinson. He handed me my shift and walked out. Alice came up to me as I began the calibration procedure. How are you holding up? she asked. I'll be fine, ma'am, I said. Drop the ma'am thing, Bill, she said. We've worked together before. Seriously, how are you holding up? It's not easy, but I can handle it, Alice. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Look, I know you have a lot on your mind, but I think you need to look after your wife and Commander Travers. I looked at her, shocked. Do you think there's something going on between them? I asked. Maybe. Call it female intuition if you want, Bill. I just have a feeling that something might be happening out there. I've seen it before. Little glances here and there, that sort of thing. Nothing overt, but there's definitely a spark between these two, she said. Got it, Alice. Thanks for letting me know. I plan to meet with her on my lunch break. Hope that helps, I said. I hope so too, Bill, she said. Should we tell the captain, I asked her. She shook her head. Not unless you have solid evidence against them. Such an accusation against a senior officer can backfire and severely damage your career, she said. Just stay alert and try to keep your wife alert. I'll keep an eye on things during the first shift. Okay, Alice, I said. Thanks for the heads up. She nodded her head and left the bridge. I checked the calibration procedure and went to inventory the cruise missiles and inspect the weapon stations. When I returned, Alan was already waiting for me. Would you like to practice target shooting? He asked. Shit, I'm always up for target practice, I thought to myself. Yes, sir, I told him. All right, he said. Launch a few drones and let's see what you've got. I set the station to launch a series of five drones, then activated the short-range mini-lasers. They acted much like the old miniguns. A series of six powerful and very hot lasers were set up just like the old Gatling guns. The laser fire from these weapons was very intense and could burn through several inches of armor in the blink of an eye. I once saw them cut an old armored battleship in two. The belt armor on it was over 12 inches thick, but the lasers cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Once the drones were launched, I aimed the mini lasers at them. The system was designed to track and fire on up to 10 targets at a time. It only took a second or two for the lasers to destroy the drones. I glanced at my console and saw the message. All targets destroyed. Well done, Lieutenant, Alan said with a smile. Thank you, sir, I replied. He got up from his chair and walked over to my desk. I'm going to get some rest, Lieutenant. It looks like you'll be the senior officer on watch, so why don't you take the center chair? I'll be back just in time for your lunch break, he said with a knowing smile. Having served with Alan before, I knew him as the king of power naps. He was one of those people who could stay awake for almost 24 hours with only three or four hours of sleep. I assumed that came with years of command experience. Yes, sir, thank you, I said in reply. He left the bridge and I took his seat. It felt good to be sitting in the commander's chair. From here, I could keep an eye on everything that was happening on the ship. And then it hit me. Each crew member wore a device on their wrist that not only told time and served as an alarm clock, but also served as a communicator a tracking device, and monitored our vital signs. All crew members were required to wear the device at all times. The only time we were allowed to take it off was when we showered. I turned on the tracking monitor on the command console and looked for Travers. The monitor showed that he was in his quarters. More accurately, the monitor showed that the tracker was in his quarters. When I looked a little deeper, I noticed that he was in a deep sleep, and his pulse rate was normal for someone in that state. That could only happen if he was actually wearing the thing. I looked for Jones and was given two choices, William, me, and Tabitha. I chose Tabitha and saw that her beacon was in our quarters. Good. Like Bull, her tracker showed she was asleep and her vitals were normal for someone in that condition. I thought about accessing the history of both trackers, but realized I'd need a command or medical password to do so. Since I had neither, I couldn't tell if the two of them were engaged in other, more strenuous activities. But what I saw was enough, I thought. It would be very difficult for the two of them to fake something like that, so I turned off the tracking monitor and went about my business. I looked around the bridge. 
Everyone was busy at their stations and working hard. It was like I wasn't even here. I went back to my console and reviewed the checklist. So far, everything was working within normal limits. We were due for a course correction in about an hour, but I knew it was already programmed into the navigation system and would be done automatically. The communications officer on watch was in constant communication with someone in flight control in Houston, and I knew I wouldn't have to get involved unless a situation arose that required the captain's immediate attention. The engineer on duty was keeping a close eye on the condition of the engines and the ship's vital systems. The helmsman and navigator closely monitored the ship's flight, making sure that the upcoming course correction would go smoothly. I made the necessary log entries for the hour and walked over to the weapons console to make a quick check. Everything seemed to be in order, so I walked back to the center chair and sat down. About two hours after the shift started, Petty Officer Marks went around to all the posts, collecting drink orders for everyone. We were allowed to drink in our seats, but on the condition that they were covered and straws were used. She left and returned a little while later from the galley handing out drinks to everyone. A few minutes before I was due to start lunch, Alan returned and I yielded the big chair to him, briefly recounting the events that had taken place so far. He nodded his head, taking a seat and making an entry in his journal. Thank you, Lieutenant, he said. Why don't you go take your lunch break, he added with a slight wink. Yes, sir, I said as I left my post. I headed towards the quarters that Tabby and I shared and stopped right in front of the open hatch. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. She had just woken up. The alarm clock had gone off. God, she's so beautiful, I thought, walking towards her. Are you ready for dinner? She asked defiantly. I smiled and sat down on the bed with her. You know I do, I said and started kissing her. Then we made love. God, that was so good, she said. I really needed that. Me too, I told her. I missed you. And I missed you too. I love you so much. I love you too, I replied. You'd better get cleaned up and get on the road, she said. You haven't even eaten yet. I looked at the time and saw that it was about 40 minutes until the end of the break. Yeah, you're right, I said. Do you want to do it again, maybe on your lunch break? Sure, why not, she said with a smile. Feeling a little better, I got out of bed, took a quick shower and headed for the galley. Before leaving the cabin, I kissed her, then dimmed the lights and lowered the gravity level in the room to 0.7 Gs. I knew the only reason I could perform was because of my knowledge of Gravtalk, and I knew Bull wasn't familiar with it. Keep in mind that sex in space is not easy. Forget what you've seen in the movies. For starters, in microgravity, blood rushes to your head, not your penis. Fortunately, the gravity on the ship was defaulted to 0.8 G, which barely allowed us to enjoy each other. But it still wasn't easy. I had no doubt that if gravity had been set lower than it was now, we probably wouldn't have been able to do what we did. Another problem is that testosterone levels drop in microgravity, and over a long period of time, the heart can shrink, reducing the volume of blood in the circulatory system. These are just some of the reasons why NASA opposed sending couples into space a century ago. Another reason has to do with complications during pregnancy and childbirth. Nevertheless, there have been many stories over the years involving couples in orbit. I remember reading about a cosmonaut who spent 14 months on the Russian Mir station in the 1990s. According to the story, he got close to a female cosmonaut, which led some to think they were doing dirty deeds in orbit. Kremlin officials denied the allegations, and the cosmonaut wrote about it later. We don't need to say what we crave. Men think of these things. It's impossible to dismiss them. But with time, these thoughts somehow subside, he wrote. He also revealed that his superior suggested he take a doll with him, but he feared he might get too attached to the inflatable toy. Many of the limitations of the old space administration were carried over when the Corps began sending humans into orbit. But the development of artificial gravity in the early 2090s made many of those restrictions moot. So the Corps backed off a bit and allowed married couples to have sexual relations in space, provided some form of birth control was used, and the gravity level was set at 0.8 G. I felt much better as I ate my tuna sandwich and headed back to the bridge. When I got there, I still had two minutes left before the break. Alan looked at me as I took my seat. Did you have a good lunch, Lieutenant? He asked. Yes, sir, a very good lunch, I told him. 
He smiled and nodded his head. Good. Carry on, he said, turning back to his console. The next 17 days went pretty much the same way. Tabby came to our cabin several times during our lunch break, and of course I joined her on my lunch breaks at every opportunity. Being able to see each other at least part of the time helped me get through this part of the trip. I didn't see much of Bull during this time, and that helped too. I still had some concerns, of course, but I hadn't seen or heard anything to suggest that anything suspicious was going on. Alice kept me informed, but said she hadn't seen or heard anything either. When we got to Mars Station, I began to think I might have made a big deal out of it. After the Armstrong docked with Mars Station, I put on my Class C uniform in anticipation of a shore leave with Tabby. But my hopes of spending time with her at Huygens Base, a domed structure named after the Dutch astronomer who drew pictures of the red planet with a telescope of his own design, were dashed when Bull informed me that there was a problem with one or more of the weapon stations. What? I asked, shocked. The last time I'd checked them, which had been just a few hours earlier during my shift, there hadn't been any problems with them. I looked at Lieutenant Robinson. Were you aware of any problems? I asked him. He shook his head. Just before the dock, sir, he told me. There was something very suspicious about it, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it. We're only here for 72 hours, Bull said. And by the time we launch, these weapons should be ready to go. So you'd better get on it, Jones. I looked at Tubby and shook my head. It will be all right, dear, she said with a sad expression on her face. We'll still have a chance to visit Huygens together. I'll bring you a souvenir, okay? Bull grinned. Don't worry, Jones, I'll look after your wife. I promise, he said. Yeah, I'm sure you will, you son of a bitch, I thought. At that moment, Alan came up to us. So, are you ready for a little rest on the beach? He asked. Yes, Bull said. But Jones needs to take a look at the weapon systems. Is there a problem? Asked Alan. Calibration of the two mini lasers has been disrupted, sir, Robinson said. When did this happen? Asked Alan. I spotted him before I secured the station, sir, Robinson said. Alan frowned and looked at me. Then you'd better take a look, Lieutenant, he said. I'll look at them with you if you don't mind. Not at all, sir, I said, glancing at Bull. I appreciate that. I'll stay and help, Lieutenant, Robinson said. Thanks, Robinson, I appreciate it, I said. Well, I guess we'd better get to the station before all the shuttles leave, Bull said. Tabby looked at me sadly but didn't say anything. Do it, number one, Alan said. Bull and Tabby turned and walked away. I couldn't help but notice that she never told me that she loved me or that I would see her later. I turned and looked at Alice. It stinks to high heaven, Bill, she said to me quietly. I'll keep an eye on them there. Thank you, I said. She smiled and patted my hand before walking away. Well, I guess I'd better change into my work clothes, I said. What lasers have you had trouble with? Number two and number five, sir, Robinson said. Okay, I'll take number two if you can check five. But we'll need to check them all, I said. On my way, sir, Robinson said. I turned to leave and saw Alan looking at the door through which Bull and Tubby had exited earlier. I could see the wheels turning in his head. I'll change and meet you at Laser Station 2 if that's okay with you, sir, I said. I'll meet you there in a few minutes, he said. I grabbed my tool bag and left the bridge. I had been at the station for a few minutes when Alan came crawling up beside me. I noticed that he had changed back into his work uniform. What's that word? he asked. Just getting ready to remove the control box cover, I said. I got the tool out and started to remove the cover. With the cover off, I looked inside and saw the problem. One of the gears that make up the drive system had sheared off and broken. The E-clamp that held it in place was also missing. I looked to see if it was lying around in the bottom of the sealed unit, but it wasn't there. It was missing, completely. Shit, I said. What? asked Alan. Someone has been in that device, sir, I said. The E-clamp is gone and the drive gear is sheared off and broken. What would happen if guns were involved? The force of the drive impact would have completely destroyed the system. 
If lasers were firing at the same time, they could have cut through the hull, I said. Damn! How do you think that could have happened? He asked. I shook my head. Someone must have done it on purpose, I said. I don't see how a clip could just go missing like that. The thing is, these devices are usually sealed. The only way to get inside is with a special tool. This one, I added, holding the tool in my hand. Can it be fixed? He asked. Of course, I said. There are spare control units in the armory. But it's not the kind of part that usually breaks, and we only have two spare control units. I hope none of the others were damaged. How long will it take to repair? The whole unit has to be disassembled. A new control unit installed, tested, adjusted, and calibrated. About eight to ten hours in total. And that's assuming there are no other problems. Damn, he said. All right, install a new control unit. You need my help? Although it was time-consuming, it was a one-man job, and I really didn't need his help. Still, what he offered meant a lot, and I began to respect him even more for it. I shook my head. No, sir, I can manage, but thanks for asking anyway, I said. Besides, there's only room for one pair of hands. At that moment, my wrist communicator beeped. I looked and saw it was a call from Robinson. Jones, go ahead, Robinson, I said, turning to the communicator. Boss, it looks like the E-clamp has broken off and the drive gear is completely sheared off, he said. I looked at Alan. We need to replace the entire control box. All right, I said. Proceed. Contact the armory and have them inspect all the weapons platforms. On it, he said. What's the probability of two control units breaking down at the same time? Asked Alan. Very subtle, I said. I've never seen one of these units break like that, let alone two at the same time. These are probably the most stable platforms in our arsenal. Perhaps it's a manufacturing problem? He asked. Very unlikely, sir, I said. These devices go through extensive testing before installation. I've worked with hundreds of these devices, and I've never seen this happen. Okay. I need to report this to Houston, Alan said. We'd better get the engineers from the Martian station down here and delay a full level 5 diagnostic. It's hard to believe a trillion dollar spacecraft can be stopped by a 50 cent eclip. I grinned. Report back to me as soon as you're done. Yes, sir, I said. I watched him make his way out of the cramped quarters and went back to my work. When the control box was completely removed, I took a closer look to see what else I could find. There, on the inside of the hull, was a dark spot. It didn't look like transmission grease. When I looked closer, I realized it was blood. Whoever had sabotaged this device had cut their hand on the casing. I pulled a pair of tweezers out of the toolbox and was able to take some of the substance. I then put it in a small plastic bag, sealed it, and put it back in the tool bag. I intended to take it to a medical facility for DNA testing. By then, one of the armorers had brought in a new control box and took the old one away. I went back to my work and tried to concentrate on what I was doing, but it was difficult. I thought about who could have done this and why. And then it hit me. Bull did everything he could to keep Tabby and me apart during this trip. First, the shift schedule changed. Of course, he offered an explanation. Alan accepted it, but I didn't believe it. Then this happened. And what did he say when he and Tabby left for Huyens? Something about taking care of Tabby? Maybe. The thought that Tabby might cheat on me with him made me furious and nauseous at the same time. I knew Bull had been her counselor at the academy, and I also knew they'd served together a couple of times since then. Had she been having fun with him then, too? I finally finished installing the new control box and did a dry test. Everything seemed to be in order, and I made an entry in the maintenance log. Ten hours of my life were gone. Ten hours that I would never get back. Ten hours I was supposed to spend on Huygens with Tabby. Finished, I looked through the entire log, but saw nothing that would give me a clue. I saw Robinson as I climbed out of the access tube. How'd it go? I asked him. The new unit is in place, sir, he said. Armorers have checked the rest of the stations and have reported no other problems. Anyway, I want to do a full visual inspection of everything, as well as an inventory of all weapons and missiles, I said. I know it will ruin your shore leave, but it needs to be done. 
I understand, sir, he said. I'll look into it. Thank you, I said. He nodded his head, smiled, and turned to his work. On my way to the bridge, I stopped in sickbay and talked to the corpsman on duty. How are you doing, Lieutenant Jones? The female senior asked as I walked in. Are you willing to do a DNA test? I asked. We have the equipment, but the final analysis has to be verified by a certified laboratory, she said. Why do you ask? I pulled out my sample and held it out to her. I need to know whose blood it is, I said. Can you do that? Of course, she said. It'll take a few hours and we'll need to compare it to the DNA we have. Why would you want to do that? I really can't get into that right now, Chief, I said. I just need to know whose it is. And I need you to keep that under your hat. She looked at me in surprise. Okay, Lieutenant, she said. I'll look into it and send you a message when I have something. Thanks, Chief. I owe you one, I said. Damn right, sir, she said with a smile. She was quite attractive, and for a moment I wondered what she looked like without that uniform. But only for a moment. After that, I headed to the bridge to make my report. Alan was standing at the hatch leading to his ready room when I went up to the bridge. Fixed it? he asked. Yes, sir, I said. Lieutenant? Robinson is checking the rest of the systems now. All right. Step into my office if you would be so kind, he said. I walked into the ready room and saw Alice with Lieutenant. Commander Carson, the ship's senior security officer. When Alan entered the small room, he closed the hatch and took his seat. Thank you for showing up so quickly, he said, looking at Alice and Commander Carson. I'm sorry to interrupt your shore leave, Alice, but it seems we have a situation here and I need you and Commander Carson to deal with it immediately. No problem, sir, she said. It appears we have a saboteur aboard, Alan said. Two of our weapon systems appear to have been sabotaged shortly before arriving at Mars Station, and I've been assigned by command to conduct an initial investigation. I've also been assigned to contact the Core Criminal Investigations Division on Huygens. They won't be able to get anyone in here for at least 36 hours, so you have that time to figure out everything you can. I'm temporarily giving you both access to the entire tracker history. I want to know who accessed those weaponized units, and I want to know that as soon as possible. I want this investigation to be thorough but discreet. Do you understand me? I don't want the crew members to find out, he said. We understand, sir, Commander Carson said. In the meantime, a team of engineers from Mars is running full diagnostics on the ship at level 5. It will take about 72 hours. Command doesn't want us heading out with a possible saboteur on board, and I agree with them. It's quite possible the mission will be canceled, Alan said. Any questions or comments? Just one, sir, I said. All eyes turned to me. Yes, Lieutenant, asked Alan. I found blood on the control box housing I replaced. I took a sample to sickbay for DNA analysis, I said. Good idea, Alan said. I'll swing by sickbay. Who did you give the sample to? Chief Benson, sir, I said. He nodded his head in acknowledgement. Okay. I'll talk to her when I get there. Thank you. Anything else? We all shook our heads. Dismissed. You have a job to do. Yes, sir, Commander Carson said. We left the ready room, and I locked my tool bag on the weapons console. I was about to leave the bridge when Alice called out to me. Yes, ma'am. I said, giving her my attention. Bill, I've been watching Tubby and Commander Travers for a while. I'm sorry, but it seems to me that they're... Know each other too well, if you know what I mean, she said. She pulled out her cell phone and showed me the pictures. I was shocked by what I saw. Tubby and Bull were walking into the club hand in hand. Alice had pictures of them dancing and drinking, acting like two teenagers on a date. There was the usual flirting and touching, and Alice had pictures of them kissing. Then she showed me pictures of them walking into the hotel. It didn't take a scientist to figure out what they were doing there. I'm sorry, Bill, she said quietly. I thought you should know. Thank you, Alice, I said, holding back tears. Are you going to report this to the captain? You know I have no choice but to report it, she said. But I thought you should be the first to know. 
I appreciate that, I said. I left the bridge and caught up with Robinson. We finished sorting out the rest of the systems and took inventory of everything. My shift was over and I went to the galley and had a snack, then went back to my quarters and tried to sleep. It wasn't easy, with images of Tubby and Bull in my mind's eye, but I managed to stay awake for a few hours. I woke up, showered, got dressed, and was about to leave when Tabby walked into the cabin. She looked rested and her face was shining like it always did after sex. Part of me wanted to kill her. Did you have a good time? I asked in a neutral tone. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are, she said. We've just gotten back. I'm sorry you couldn't join us. Maybe next time. I just looked at her. What's going on? I saw all the engineers on the station. Maintenance, I said. So what's on your agenda? Well, I'm going to lie down for a while. I'm really tired and I'm off duty for the next 12 hours. Are you going on duty now? Yes, I said. Were you able to solve that little problem? I think so. Good, she said. You know I missed you out there. Really? That's not what I heard, I said. What does that mean? I hear you and Bull had a good time without me, I said. Is there anything you want to tell me? We danced a little bit, she said. Had a couple drinks each. But that's about it. Nothing else happened? I asked. Of course not, she said, feigning shock. What makes you think that? Nothing, I said. I have to go to work. I headed for the door, but Tabby stopped me. She tried to kiss me, but I turned away and she kissed my cheek. Bill, you know I love you, she said. What's going on? You tell me, I said. I left the cabin without giving her a chance to answer. Who is this woman, I asked myself. Did she really think she could come to me right after sleeping with some other guy and expect me to act like there was no problem? Did she really think I wouldn't be able to see through her lies? I walked into my station and realized I hadn't seen Bull. I went about my normal business and moved on to my current diagnostics. About seven hours into my shift, I realized I hadn't eaten anything, so I filed out and took a lunch break. I decided to go to my quarters and see Tabby for a bit before returning to duty. I had planned to talk things over with her, but when I opened the hatch, what stood before me was something no husband should ever have to see. On the double bed that Tabby and I shared, Tabby was lying on top of Bull. I felt an increase in gravity and looked to see that the gravity in the cabin was set at 0.9 G. They both turned to see who was standing in the open hatch. Tabby jumped down and he turned to me with a smirk on his face. Close the damn hatch, he growled. What are you, some kind of pervert or something? Do you like to watch? What's going on here? I asked. Tabby found something interesting on the deck to gawk at while Bull rose to his feet. What does it look like, Lieutenant? He asked, pulling on his clothes. Didn't they teach you sex education in school? He finished putting on his flight suit and headed toward me. Let's take a walk, Lieutenant. We need to talk? He turned to Tabby. I'll be back and we can finish this conversation later. Tabby looked at me with sad eyes. I'm sorry, Bill, she said quietly. We'll talk about it later, I said. Bull shook his head. No, Lieutenant, he said. Come on. Follow me. As we turned, I activated the video recording function on my suit. All of our suits had a TV camera function that could be activated when needed. I had a very bad feeling about this, and I wanted our encounter to be recorded. I must commend you, Lieutenant. It was a great idea to reduce the gravity in your quarters, Bull said as we walked down the corridor. But you should know that I've been here a little longer than you have. It didn't take me long to realize what you did. How long? I asked. You mean for how long, sir? Don't you, Lieutenant? He asked with a smirk. I remained silent, prompting him to continue. Well, I suppose you have a right to know. It started in my second year at the academy. I was her counselor, you know. She came to me with a problem. I was able to solve it. But it cost her money. And it just kept escalating. You know, she almost broke up with you a couple times during your time at the academy. You see, once a woman gets a taste of bull, she can't let it go. He must have thought he was funny because he laughed at his own joke. I felt nothing but rage. 
I wanted to kill him on the spot, but I had no desire to ruin my career over this piece of shit. So you entertain her every chance you get, huh? I asked. Sure, Lieutenant, he said. You know, you should be a goddamn investigator. And that's the real reason you changed the bridge schedule, isn't it? I asked. Right again, Jones, he said. And the reason you sabotage those weapon systems, I added. Just between you and me, yes, he said. But you see, after the skipper informed me of the sabotage, I did a little investigation of my own, he added, taking the word investigation in quotation marks. So, what do you intend to do next? I asked. Are you planning on beating me up or killing me? He laughed as we turned the corner and entered the elevator. He pressed the third deck button and waited for the elevator doors to close. Of course not, Lieutenant, he said. You think I'd kill a highly trained officer just for a piece of ass? For the moment, yes, I said. The elevator doors opened and he stepped out, gesturing for me to follow. That's where you're wrong, he said. You see, according to my investigation, which I have just completed, you caught your wife having sex. Distraught, you set about sabotaging the weapon systems, hoping to frame your wife's lover. When she told you that she intended to divorce you for him, you became desperate and killed yourself. He stopped, and I saw that we were standing in front of the starboard airlock, the airlock that was on the opposite side of the station from where we were docked. The inner hatch was open, and I saw that all the spacesuits in the airlock had been removed. I also saw the semi-automatic pistol in his hand, strapped to his right wrist. I wondered when he had put it on, and realized that he must have hidden it in his spacesuit. You've got it all figured out, haven't you? I asked. Yeah, he said with a smirk on his face. Don't worry, Lieutenant. After you leave, I'll take care of her properly. Now get to the airlock. You'll never get away with it, I said. He laughed at that. Yeah? Who do you think Command will believe? A Piscuit who can't even satisfy his own wife? Or a 20-year veteran of spaceflight? Now get in the airlock, he said. I looked around and assessed the situation. Looking at the nearest gravity regulator, I saw that it was set at 0.8 G. Not ideal, but I figured it was for the best. It was now or never. I jumped up as high as I could and put one hand on the bulkhead. I kicked as hard as I could twice and caught him by surprise, hitting him in the face both times. The force of the blow threw him back into the airlock where he landed on the floor. I could see blood on his face where I had hit him. Once he landed, I rushed to the control panel and quickly closed and locked the hatch. He shook his head, surprised at what had just happened. He looked at me furious. Open the damn door, Lieutenant, he shouted. Just one question, Commander, I said. What? Did Tabitha know what you were planning to do? Of course she did, he said. It was her idea. Now open the damn door. I won't tell you anymore, he added, raising his gun. He cocked the trigger and took aim right at me. Now, damn it. I looked at the controls before answering. Yes, sir, I hissed, pressing the brightly lit button. His eyes widened as he realized what I had done. The outer door hissed open and the air from the room rushed out into the open. Caught off guard, he stumbled to his own feet and quickly found himself in the harshest environment known to man. I watched his body tumble through space as he left the ship. I knew he would only last 15 seconds without a spacesuit. There is no pressure in space, and I knew that the air left in his lungs would rapidly expand and painfully tear his lung tissue. He would either freeze to death or die of suffocation. I pressed the button to activate the comms. Man overboard, number two starboard airlock, I said. Instantly, the alarm sounded, and a crowd appeared at the airlock. I looked up and saw Alan running toward me. Next to him was Alice. A few moments later, I saw Tabby. Commander Travers, sir, I said. I handed him a tiny drive containing a videotape of the last few minutes. He admitted to sabotaging the weapon and admitted to having an affair with Lieutenant Jones. He also admitted that he planned to kill me and frame it as a suicide. It's all here. Bull! exclaimed Tabby, peering into the airlock. By now, the force of Bull's ejection had sent his body into an unstable orbit around Mars, and it would take hours to recover, if at all. She turned to me, tears streaming down her face. You killed him! she screamed. 
You goddamn bastard. You killed him. I hate you. Do you hear me? I hate you. That will be enough, Lieutenant, Alan ordered. He grabbed Tabby by the shoulders and handed her to the orderlies. Take her to sickbay. Get her under control. Then hand her over to security. He turned to me as the orderlies carried her away. You know what to do, Lieutenant, he said sadly. I have no choice. You are relieved of all duties for the duration of the investigation. I'll look into it. Yes, sir, I said quietly. Okay, that's enough, Alan ordered. Get back to work. There's nothing more we can do here. Before he spoke again, he turned to Commander Carson. When she calms down, give her a statement. I don't want her anywhere near the bridge. Call Mars Station and find out how to recover Commander Travers's body. Yes, sir, Carson said before walking away. Then Alan turned to Alice. Looks like you just got promoted, Alice, he said. Until further notice, you're my number one. You'll need to adjust your bridge assignments. After that, the mission will probably be canceled. I understand, sir, she said. Commander Carson and I have completed our initial investigation, sir. We'd like to discuss our findings with you. In my room, number one, he said. Immediately. Yes, sir, she said. Before she left, she turned to me. I'm sorry, Bill, she said to me. You didn't deserve any of this. Thank you, Commander, I said, and headed for my quarters. Once there, I pulled out all of Tabby's things and put them in her duffel bag. I didn't want her anywhere near me, and I knew she would probably be assigned the cabin originally designated for the chief pilot, which was now empty. A couple hours later, someone from security came and took her things. I didn't know where they had taken them, and frankly, I didn't care. I turned over the rubberized mattress and replaced the soiled bedding, tossing the old one into the laundry basket. I knew that until further notice, I would be confined to my quarters, and my access would be limited to the galley and gym. So I sat down at the computer console in my stateroom and started going through the JAG forms until I found the one that contained the divorce request. I filled out a form requesting a divorce on the grounds of adultery. Since our marriage was under the jurisdiction of the JAG Corps, the divorce also had to be finalized by them. There was nothing to divide and there were no children. We each had the same salary, so there was no support. It was a simple division where she kept what was hers and I kept what was mine. I asked that she give up my last name and return her rings. After checking everything, I clicked Submit and waited for confirmation that the request had been received by the JAG system. It's amazing how fast the system works sometimes. Within 24 hours of the incident, I was talking to not one, but two agents from Huygens CIA. It was clear to me that they were trying to make the case that I had acted out of revenge. The JAG officer they brought with them to represent me at the interrogation did not allow me to make any statements that might incriminate me. I spent the next 24 hours on edge, wondering if I would be taken into custody. I spent most of the time pacing back and forth in my quarters. I knew that what Tubby and Bull had done would now be common knowledge on the ship, so I purposely stayed away from the galley during regular meal times so I wouldn't run into the rest of the crew. I was sitting on the bed when I heard a knock on the hatch. I wondered if it was station security coming to take me into custody, and I braced myself for the worst. It's open, I said. When the hatch opened, I saw Alan and Alice standing there. I turned my attention to them as they entered the small room. As it was, Lieutenant, Alan said, sitting down in his chair. Alice sat down as well. I relaxed and sat back down on the bed. The Mars station had recovered Commander Travers's body. They also took the illegal firearm that was strapped to his arm. We've reviewed all the evidence and the CIU report says you acted in self-defense. The tracking history logs show that Commander Travers was at both weapon stations, where the sabotage took place just before Lieutenant Robinson noticed the calibration error, Alice added. And the DNA from the blood you found matches the commander's. Put that together with what he admitted to you, and it becomes clear that he was the one who sabotaged both of those systems, Alan said. Your wife claims she knew nothing about the sabotage, but she supposedly knew what he intended to do to you. But Travers told me it was her idea, I said. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Who knows? At any rate, she's being held in the brig as an accessory to Commander Travers' plot to assassinate you. Perhaps she'll be charged with conspiracy, but that's up to the authorities on Earth. 
So we're going back to Earth, sir? I asked. He nodded his head. It is, Bill, he said. The mission has been canceled, at least for the moment. Command intends to hold a board of inquiry when we get back. Does that mean I can go back to work? I asked. It took some work, but I convinced Houston that you were needed on the bridge since we're down two officers. Think you can handle both ops and gunnery? Alice tells me you're ready to handle ops. Yes, sir, I said. Good, he said. We launch in 12 hours, so I want you rested and ready to go. Thank you, sir, I said. Is it okay if I see my wife? I need some answers. Are you sure you want to do this, Bill? He asked. I'm absolutely sure, sir, I told him. He thought for a moment, then nodded his head. All right, Bill, he said at last. I'll allow it, but on the condition that you be accompanied by Commander Brewster. Do you agree, Alice? Yes, sir, she said. That's right, he said. Well, get to work, son, and then get some rest. It's about time you started earning your paycheck. Yes, sir, I said. He stood up, signaling the end of the meeting. When he left, Alice looked at me. Are you ready, Lieutenant? She asked. I nodded my head. Yes, ma'am, I said. We got out and headed for the brig, located on the lower deck of the ship. Don't tell anyone I told you this, but Captain Simmons has declared a commendation for you, she said. For what? I asked, surprised. He says your actions saved not only your life, but the lives of many of your comrades. Had Travers fired that weapon while in the airlock, there is no telling what damage it would have done to the ship, she said. Shit, I said. She smiled. Congratulations, she said. We finally made it to the brig and checked in with the security officer on duty. Then we walked to a tiny seven-by-six-foot cell where Tabby sat on the bed, dressed in an orange jumpsuit. What do you want, Lieutenant? She asked, sarcasm and mockery in her voice. So now it's Lieutenant. Not even Bills or Lieutenant Jones, I said. Okay, have it your way, prisoner. I just have a few questions and then I'll leave you alone. Ask your questions, Lieutenant, she said, looking straight ahead, not even bothering to look at me. How long have you been having fun with Travers? Since sophomore year at the academy, she said. He was my counselor. I know, I said. Where did it all start? Do you really want to know? She asked. Yeah, I know, I said. Okay. Since you asked. I failed the test. He corrected it for me. I almost lost the assignment. But I didn't. Thanks to him, I was able to retake the test. I owed him a debt of gratitude, so I entertained him. I enjoyed having fun with him, and I kept doing it. So you two cheated on each other, and then you repaid him by cheating on me. Is that it? Yes, she said. You have no idea how many times you had me in the hours after he did? And you know what? I loved it. You know what else? What? I asked, ready to throw up after what she had just told me. He's been to places you could never get to. I'm surprised you were able to feel me at all after the way he entertained me. And you had fun with him all those times you worked with him? When we can, she said. You know that sex in low class is almost impossible. That's why we did it before we left and after we got back. Did you ever love me or is it all a lie? I loved you, she said. But I loved having fun with him. And that's all it was. Just the sex? Nothing more. You knew what he was going to do once we were on board, didn't you? Yeah, I knew. I knew he was going to spread out the shifts so we couldn't see each other often. But he didn't think you'd find a way to carve out time to talk to me. To be honest, neither did I. But you tricked us both. So we decided to wait until we got to Mars, she said. And you knew he would sabotage the weapons platforms? I knew he was going to do something, but I didn't know what, she said. All I knew was that he was going to make it so you couldn't take shore leave. We didn't think you were going to turn this into a federal case. And me throwing myself out of the airlock was just icing on the cake, right? He told me it was your idea. Was it? Did you really hate me so much you wanted to kill me? It was his idea, she said. 
but you put up with it. You never once did anything or told anyone to stop it, did you? No, it wasn't, she said quietly. And I'm sorry about that. I didn't think he'd really do it. Well, he tried. And he failed. And you're going to end up in jail for your part in it. I hope it was worth it for you. By the way, I filed for divorce. Big deal, she said with a shrug. I shook my head and stood up. I was so proud of you, the way you handled that ship. I loved you with all my heart. But now I wish I had never met you. I can't wait to testify against you at your court-martial. Goodbye, bitch. I turned to leave and heard her calling my name. I'm sorry, Bill, she cried. Really, I'm sorry. Without looking back, I raised my middle finger and continued walking. After returning to Earth, Tabby was placed in a federal prison where she was held throughout the inquest and court-martial. Several crew members, including myself, Alan, and Alice, were called to testify. We spent hours testifying and answering questions from several investigators and high-ranking officers. The worst were the days spent waiting for something, anything, to happen. The only thing that happened was the approval of my divorce, which was received in early April. All that was left was to file in state court, which the JAG officer said he would do. Finally, on Friday, April 18th, we were called into the hearing room to learn our fate. Alan, Alice, and I sat in one row, and Tabby was led into the hall. Like us, she was in uniform, but unlike us, she was wearing chains around her ankles and wrists. Two armed prison guards in black uniforms accompanied her, ready for action. We all stood as the council members were ushered into the hall, their uniforms adorned with ribbons and gold braids denoting their rank. Admiral Cartwright, the senior member of the council, opened the meeting. Please be seated, he began. First of all, let me say that this is simply a board of inquiry, not a trial. Our job is to find out what happened and make recommendations so it doesn't happen again. He then read the council's summary of what had happened on the trip to Mars. He concluded with a simple statement. In sum, Commander Travers's personal agendas took precedence over his duty to the ship, captain, crew, and the Corps, resulting in a violation of the law, not to mention a number of established protocols. As a result of his actions, many of those who served aboard the Armstrong were put in danger and the ship was disabled, he said. He turned his attention to me. Senior Lieutenant William Jones, he said. Hearing my name, I froze in place. He looked at me for a moment before continuing. Lieutenant Jones, the board has reviewed all of the evidence in this case and has concluded that your actions not only saved your own life, but quite possibly the lives of many of your shipmates. In addition, your diligence, initiative, and attention to detail were instrumental in detecting and eliminating deliberate sabotage that very easily could have cost the lives of many people, not to mention a trillion-dollar spacecraft. This board has reviewed your record, and we agree with Captain. Simmons' assessment. As a result, we approved his recommendation to award you the Distinguished Service Medal. In addition, we believe your talents will be of great benefit to the Corps in our future endeavors. You can expect your orders to arrive at the Spacecraft Advanced Operations School for classes that will begin June 1st. Congratulations and best of luck. Thank you, sir, I said. The Admiral nodded his head and turned his attention to Alan. Captain Alan Simmons, he said. Alan stood at attention. Please understand that the Council believes that you have done the best you can under the circumstances. We understand your desire not to undermine the authority of senior personnel in the eyes of the crew. And frankly, none of us have ever faced a situation like this before. Nevertheless, as captain and master of your ship, you are directly responsible for everything that happens on it. I understand, Admiral, Alan said. The Council agrees that you should remain in command of the USS Armstrong, however there is an entry on your record. The Armstrong is currently undergoing modernization, and a new crew assignment will be made. We agree that Lieutenant Som Doctor. Brewster would be a good choice as first officer. Therefore, the board recommends that she be immediately promoted to commander and assigned to the first officer position. You can expect a new set of mission orders in the near future, he said. Thank you, Admiral, Alan said. Then the Admiral shifted his gaze to Tabby. Senior Lieutenant Tabitha Abernathy, he said, calling Tabby by her maiden name, which she had to take as a result of her divorce. Tabby stood up as the others did. It would be an understatement to say that this board is very disappointed in you. Not only have you dishonored your ex-husband, 
You have dishonored your uniform and the service as a whole. Your actions in this whole sordid affair, no pun intended, may well have jeopardized the lives of many of your shipmates, including your ex-husband. As a result of statements entered into the record by both you and Commander Travers, we have been forced to evaluate your entire record, including your work at the Academy. We have been able to confirm that Commander Travers, acting as your counselor, intervened to help you pass the test you initially failed. Had he not intervened on your behalf, you likely would not have passed the test and would not have received your commission. Of course, your record as a pilot was exemplary, but we can't help but believe that you should not have received your commission to begin with. The sexual encounter you had with Commander Travers cost him his life and nearly cost the lives of your ex-husband and several others. Your actions can only be described as unworthy of your position. We understand that you are currently facing court-martial for your actions, but this board recommended to the personnel office that you be stripped of your commission and reduced in rank and pay to an E-1 crewman. They have agreed, and your new rank and pay are effective immediately. Take her away, he said, turning to the guards. They turned her toward the door and started to walk her out, but she stopped as she approached Alan, Alice, and me. Bill, she began, and tears rolled down her face. Be careful when you address me, crewman, I said stiffly. She jumped up and looked straight ahead, tears streaming down her cheeks. Permission to address you, Lieutenant, she said. Denied, I growled. Put that thing out of my sight, I ordered the guards. They froze in anticipation. Yes, sir. They took her under the arms and led her out while she sobbed. I didn't care what she said at that point. A copy of the Council's findings will be sent to each of you and placed in your permanent file. The Council meeting is adjourned, Admiral Cartwright announced, banging the gavel. We stood as the Council left the room. After they left, Alan turned to me. Well, that wasn't so bad, he said. Why don't we have a beer or something? I'm parched. I think it's pretty good, sir, Alice said. What the hell, I added. We left the building and headed to the Oak Club, where we continued to enjoy a nice high. The epilogue is 17 months later. Standing at the airlock leading to the Galileo station orbiting the dark side of Mars, I thought back over the past 17 months. Tubby's court-martial had concluded a month before I'd enrolled in the School of Advanced Spacecraft Management. I'd testified for the prosecution, of course, and I'd done so with gusto, though I hated to think of the time I'd spent with her and Bull on Armstrong. When she was brought in, Tabby looked pretty damn attractive. This time she was wearing a crewman's uniform and no flight wings. She had lost weight and her eyes were sad and sunken. She had lost everything she loved, her rank, her wings, the man she had once called husband and lover. She had also lost all hope of a career as a pilot. No matter what happened to her today, her record was forever tarnished, and she would never take the helm of another spaceship, civilian or military. The members of the court-martial entered the courtroom, and we all stood until we were told we could take our seats. The judge looked at the members of the jury and asked if a verdict had been reached. We have reached a verdict, Your Honor, said the senior member, a full commander. When asked, the commandant said that the jury found Tabby guilty of being an accessory to the attempted murder of me, but not guilty of the conspiracy charge. Apparently, the defense won the argument that it was all he said she said, and there was no direct evidence that she was actively involved in the conspiracy to kill me. However, there was ample evidence that she knew of Travers's plan to throw me out of the airlock, but did nothing to prevent it. The judge did not spare her and sentenced her to 10 years hard labor in a federal prison. At the end of that 10-year term, she was also to receive a dishonorable discharge. The judge thanked the jury and banged his gavel, concluding the case. Tabby was led out the same way she was brought in, in chains. She never once looked at me or tried to talk to me. I reported to my class, which was in Florida, near Cape Canaveral, and enjoyed the training. I also enjoyed the weather and the scenery, which included lots of naked female flesh. After a year and a half, we graduated, and I was promoted to lieutenant commander. I also received a number of orders that brought me here to Galileo. This station, unlike the Mars station, was a closed facility that orbited the Red Planet in such a way that it could not be seen from Earth. I had no idea what was going on here, and I was curious, to say the least. When the door opened, I was greeted by an attractive female captain who was taking my orders. I introduced myself and shook her hand. 
It's a pleasure to meet you, Commander Jones, she said. I'm Captain Hawkins. I am familiar with your service on the Armstrong and have heard good things about you from Captain Simmons. I've also spoken to Alice Brewster. I looked at her, saying nothing for a while. She told me what happened, and I'm sorry. I assure you that won't be a problem here. So, are you ready to look at your house for the next few years? Years? I asked. She smiled and led me to the observation deck. When I joined her, she pressed a button and the glass in front of us dissipated. My eyes popped up to my forehead when I saw the monstrous ship in front of me. This is the biggest, fastest, and most advanced ship in the fleet, Commander. And you will be my operations officer. So you're my number two. Are you ready for adventure? I saw her eyes sparkle when she said that. Absolutely, Captain, I said. Where are we headed? If all goes well, Commander, Alpha Centauri. I looked at her, shocked. It was just over four light years away. The plan is to break the light barrier. If everything works as stated, we'll be there in less than two years. Is that even possible? I asked. She smiled and nodded her head. If the engineers are right, yes, she said. Shit, I said. She laughed. We launch in 15 days, Commander, she said. You have a lot of homework to do, so you'd better get started on it. I like to give staff briefings at 0800 every day. Yes, ma'am, I said. She held out her hand and I took it. I have some business to take care of, but I'll be in touch. Welcome aboard, Commander, she said before leaving. After she left, I looked at the ship floating in the huge bay. I looked at the side of the ship and smiled as I noticed the name, USS Enterprise. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.